All right. And the income is up top, 17 to 20 percent for those same people. And then yep. when we qualify people for mortgages now, they actually have to qualify to get paid. Hey, how you doing? Your turn. All right. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Welcome, Welcome you guys. Why do you do that? You guys want to come in? No. Have a sandwich. <laughs> Enjoy the show. <laughs> okay. It's a free, it's a free yeah. show. Well, um, Thank you guys so much for coming. I'm I'm so glad that um, that you responded and came in from the ad. Uh, there's going to be we're, we're going to we're, we're going to try and keep our presentation down to an hour, although some of us get a little talkative. Someone, that guy. Uh, <laughs> so um, we we're going to start with Walt Wiesner with Farmers Insurance. Where'd he go? He left. He just cut his head open. <laughs> Did he really? Yeah, he was helping hit our friend of us flip something, so he's in the bathroom washing it off. Oh All right, well, well <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to cover today is basically the, the whole insurance. buying process. Right. Just kind of give you a little bit of an ed education. Right. The handouts that we uh, that we put as you came in the door, there's some loan package information. There's also in the folder that I put out, um, Century, the one that says Century 21 on it, there is a sheet in there that you can fill out that tells me what your um, wishes are for your home. And so I encourage you to fill that out and leave it with me before you leave. There's also a list of the current homes that are for sale here on Pollock Pines. And also I pulled just a sampling of some of the homes and printed out the photos so that way you can get an idea in different price range what is out there. Hey Janet, how many homes are for sale here? 96. 96 There's 96 homes. Homes for sale. Yeah. Is that low inventory or is that? That's actually pretty good for Pollock Pines. In recent okay. years, we've had um, lower. It's been, you know, shoot. Earlier this year, it was more like, I think it was like 45 homes for sale. And yeah, all right. Well. Hello. All right, well. You you're ready up. to get up? Yeah, I'm not dying my hair. I just cut my head to help me sew on a Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, fortunately, you have good insurance. <laughs> Do you guys know much about mortgage insurance or should I start from the basic? Okay, so you know a little bit. Do you mind if I sit down? It's a small room. Oh, that's a great idea. Uh, you know, that's like a little bit looser with his head open. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start off with the basics of uh, homeowner's insurance. What happens is, is if you call me and ask for a quote, what I do is I ask you a whole bunch of questions about the home. How many square feet it is, what kind of interior it has, what kind of exterior. What we try to do is develop a replacement cost. And if your home burns down, we want to make sure we can replace your home. And after I get a replacement cost, the quote goes off the replacement cost. And also, how close is that fire hydrant? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. We're going to get to that too. Yeah, that's a good one right now. So what happens is, on this example right here, I came up with uh, 434000 on the dwelling. And then you get extended replacement costs, which means you usually get another 10% above and beyond that in case I'm off. So you get another 43000 on it. And then you have something called separate structure coverage. That's anything that's not attached to the home. So if you had a barn, shed, fencing. In this example, it's 10%. And insurance companies all use a percentage of the dwelling to come up with their other coverages. And personal property is now 325, and that's 75% uh, of the value of the dwelling. And we go 40, what is that said? 170,000 on loss of use. What that covers is if your home becomes uninhabitable because of an insured loss, what we'll do is put you up in a hotel and give you food for a few weeks, and then we'll rent your home somewhere here while yours is being rebuilt. Then liability is an important one. If someone gets hurt on your property, so the tree falls on my roof and takes up the whole roof and almost kills me. And it's a while ago. <laughs> yeah, good. Hey, well, what if that tree falls? My house has got a huge redwood tree. What if that falls on my neighbor's house? That's a good question. You're not liable for that. That's an act of God. You're okay, so that tree falls on my neighbor's house and he wants me to pay his deductible. You, or you can do what you want. You don't have to. You're not do I have to pay problem. my deductible? If your neighbor's tree falls on your house and it's an act of God, you have to pay your deductible. <coughs> So what if uh, we notify them that this is filled up? That tree is full of uh, bark beetles. And, it, and actually, 25 feet of bark already fell off. And it's 100 foot tall tree. Well, there has to be a covered loss. There has to be some kind of occurrence that's covered by homeowner's insurance. Usually what happens when a tree falls is wind damage. A wind will blow over the tree and that's covered. You know, I had one guy that three months ago let a neighbor cut down a tree. And guess what happened? on the house. That's not covered because that's negligence. Right. And so that's not covered. So it all depends on the circumstances. There's so many different things that can happen. The person kicked down the tree? They cut it down. They cut oh, it down. Cut it. You know, <laughs> the neighbor thought he'd be nice to cut down the 
this tree. And he didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, you've got to use a licensed bonded right. tree company to, yeah, to do totally something right. like that. Wow. Yeah, the one that took out this tree got uh, nine hundred dollars for three three minutes just to cut it down and I told him I to cut it up. Wow. <laughs> My dad paid thirty five hundred for a big oak tree to be taken out. Yep. It's expensive. I've got I've got a tree dead on my property right now that I've got an eight hundred dollar bid and I've got to get it done. But if you don't take care of something, they're gonna fall on your house. You're gonna drop it on the house, right? <laughs> no, no, good point. I'm good. <laughs> another good point too is if you're negligent uh, and something yeah. happens because you're negligent, you know, the tree dies because right. of our beetles, yeah. there could be a questionable claim because you're negligent. Right. So uh, uh, can I ask a general question? So like in, at, my, at my house right now, I have about 12 trees with beetle blight. Now they're way down below, mm -hmm. all right? But if they were near my house, and I obviously, I mean, it's expensive to get them taken out of there, right? I mean, it's not cheap. You know, I don't have 25 grand to go pay somebody to come get 12 trees, you know? Um, what do you do? It's just the choice of being homeowners. You have to try to find money. Like what happened to Trees and I, 40 days ago, our AC went up and we called a repairman. And you know how much an AC heating unit costs? Yeah. About 20000 Yeah. And what a surprise. Did you get a hold of CAPCO? Yeah, I did. I'm uh, okay. sorry, Walter. What you should have done is had a Fidelity National Home Warranty. <laughs> if you had a home warranty, <laughs> yeah. it would have been covered under your home warranty. Really? Right? So replace all the AC in the year and everything. You if, you had a, if you had a home warranty, yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. I know. I, don't I bought a house in, in Phoenix here. Well, it was in Scottsdale, Arizona. And the first day I moved in, the AC, and of course, you've got to have air something in shoot Scottsdale, 117 degrees. And the first day I moved in, my, my AC went out, and I had a home warranty. Within three days, they had a whole, and it was a t on top of the house. Oh, yeah. I and mean, it was you know, seven, eight grand to put that thing in there. Home warranty is, is very valuable. Everything. You pay $350 a year for a home warranty. I, my washing machine went out. They covered that. Our dishwasher went out. This is in one year. Mm -hmm. All these things. I've got them all in my house. Yeah. Why, why don't we have them? <laughs> Give them your card. You should exchange Walter. cards. <laughs> <laughs> Walter, you should plan ahead. <laughs> what are we going to have to do? Yeah, that's funny. So another good, good thing about homeowners insurance, what you really want to look for is you want to have building code upgrade coverage. What that does, it brings your home up to code. If, you do, if your home does burn down, it brings it up to code. Right now in this county, if your home burns down, you have to put a sprinkler system in, and those cost about 20000 If you don't have building code upgrade coverage, you're screwed. It's true. Sprinkler system wear out for you? Like the commercial? No. In, no in, in, inside, inside the house. In new construction. New yeah. residential yeah. construction. It's, it's all part of the yeah. now. So there's a lot of different. What you want to do is try to get a local and real estate agent. Most people, they know the, 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 the different uh, nuances of the house. house. Happen at home in the mountains, so it's real important to use people that. Are and Walt that is the go-to guy for here in the mountains because a lot of insurance companies, especially since the King Fire, a lot of insurance companies will not insure up here, or if they do, it's like ridiculous pricing. So um, you know, insurance is still high up here because we are in a high fire area. But um, Walt is the guy I always turn to. I always okay. send my clients, and he can usually. Hook them up with a policy. You know, a few things that homeowners insurance does not cover is it doesn't cover flood, doesn't cover earthquake, doesn't cover wear tear maintenance, doesn't cover builder defects, it doesn't cover long on term going problems, and a big one up here is it doesn't cover root damage. So you want to make sure you keep the roots out of your septic and away from the foundation. Mm -hmm. Roots out of your septic? Yeah. Go right. Yeah. And kill your leech one. Yeah. It, uh, root, roots will kill a septic system. Oh, that's a big problem. Big tech, well, in, in, in septic is has water, and the roots are attracted to the water. Run into it all the time. It's just, you know, you can look at this later, but it just goes into a little bit more detail on homeowners insurance. One of the big subjects up here is, uh, like Jack was saying, is availability. What happens is that insurance companies look at a lot of different variables, and that determines the price. One of them is we look at is called the fire protection class. That's determined by ISO and your local fire departments. And the, fire, the uh, fire protection classes go from one to 10, one being the best, 10 being the worst. If you're over five miles from your responding fire department, which parts of public lines are, you're gonna be in fire protection class 10. What do you think happens to the price? Yep. What's your up? price? What's your average price for, for uh, fire protection class 10? There's so many different variables. There's, there's, we can also look at, I'm getting ahead of myself. Say, say a 1,500 square foot yeah. house That'd down in about, Sly Park Hills. Right about 1,800, 1,900. 
a year. Right. So you're looking at 150 to 200 bucks a month. That's not, because that's typical, right? You know, I have prices so that from 600 to 5,000. I all say for 900. Yeah, and I'm and I'm paying um, a, I'm paying about 1,200 a year for uh, for my home, yeah. but I'm I'm in a lower uh, my my fire class rating is lower because I'm within five miles of the fire station. What also happens is we also look at fire hydrants. Insurance companies like to have a fire hydrant within a thousand feet. If they're not within a thousand feet, you're going to be paying more. Unless you get signed up by uh, fire. Another variable we look at is something called a fire limit score. And those go to zero to 20. Zero being the best, 20 being the worst in regards to wildland fire risk. And what the, the company that develops this score is called ISO. And ISO looks at three different variables. They look at uh, slopes within a half mile radius of a home. They look at brush within trees within a half mile radius of a home. And they also look at access points. The access points are pretty big. The insurance companies are really looking at access points now. They want two main access points because if you, you know Spike Park Hills that well? There's only one way in there. And there's only one way out. And there's how many homes in there? A few hundred. And they're all paying a lot more because they're in a fire protection class 10 and they're over five miles from your spine fire department. And also, their fire line stores are sort of high there. So there's a lot of different variables. If you buy a home in north of uh, Pony Express, on Hazel, and that area in there, it's pretty flat. There's not really much brush. Some of those scores are very low. Insurance companies grade them and they charge more the higher the score, which makes sense. Yeah, they're a higher risk. Hey, Walt, yes. I was trying to close an escrow. We were, we were like, two days from closing and we didn't have insurance so the, the buyer picked this insurance company. There wasn't a fire hydrant near the near the property. This this agent bought a plastic fire hydrant, placed it, placed it on the on the property, took a, pic, took a picture of it, sent it in to the uh, to the lender to get to get approval and we said we can't have this. This is Oh my god! No kidding, a fake fire hydrant trying to get this thing closed. Well, I have one in the trunk of my car. What are you talking about? That is ridiculous! I carry that around everywhere I so, and you need to have, have a fire hydrant, 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 but that's not You, you also, you also need to have, have a, uh, an agent <laughs> with ethics. Well, you know what happens? If you put a phony in fire hydrant, that's insurance fraud. Mm -hmm. It means that your plane can be canceled, your home burns yeah. down, and they find it's not a real fire hydrant. The fire department is going to be on you, the insurance company is going to be on you, and the insurance investigators are going to be on you. It's probably <laughs> oh, that's crazy. You hear something new every like day in this world, I swear. Way in the <laughs> back <laughs> off Dolly Barton, mm -hmm. and when you go down our street, not only is there one way into Slide Park Hills, but there's also only one way to my street, and it's a dead end road. And it's Are you on Castleberry? Shadway. Oh, yeah. And it's <laughs> next to a vacant, overgrown green belt. And then we have a fire hydrant on our right in front of our house, and then in the middle of the street is a red cap they recently painted like they had access in the street too, maybe? No, so it's just marking, that's marking the, the shut off in case they had to do something about it. Oh, okay. So does that change insurance because there's a fire hydrant at the house? To get technical, what happens is if you're already in a fire protection class 10 because you're five miles from the responding fire department, and they don't even look at fire hydrants after that. Okay. You're just automatically in the tent. They don't even look at fire hydrants. Because okay. you're already in the worst. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah. if your house does catch on fire, so that would be a good thing that there's a fire hydrant there. Right. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Right. Definitely. The only thing that probably changes is if you have a fire suppression system. You know, getting back to your guys' points is, what I find is a lot of people, they get blown away by the price when they buy insurance here. I'll quote them and they'll say, well, you're crazy. It can't be 2000 bucks." And what they'll do is they'll shop everybody in the world. They'll shop in San Francisco. They'll shop in L.A. And those people don't even know what they're doing. There's people that are unscrupulous, and they'll get you in for 600 bucks a year. And then what happens is all insurance companies send out an inspector, mm -hmm. and the inspector goes out and says, you know what, this is canceled. This is not. This is misrepresented. And then they're really in for a shot. They've squeezed in a loan at 600 bucks a year. That debt to income ratio, and that's thing you know they're paying 1,800, and there's a 1,200 dollar differential, which is 100 bucks a month, and then they're really. So it's good to use local people like Janet and Jeff and, and Pete and, because they know what they're doing. It's a very unique market. I, I, know, you know, I know exactly that avenue of a customer of mine who brought me uh, insurance from Geico. And they were over here off of Four Bay Road down here. And it was, it was like, it was so dirt cheap. I said, wait a second, man, this is not. And, and, and the coverage was enough coverage. Geico does own? Hard to believe. 
But anyway, there was no coverage was enough coverage for us, the lender, to go ahead and close the loan. But I told the you know the customer, I said, you're going to have a big bill coming here any day, right? They're going to they're going to figure something out, and then they're going to show up, and they're going to go, wait a second, you know, it's just like you said, six hundred bucks box isn't going to cover it. So right. get prepared for a two thousand dollar bill. But yeah. right. Geico, and I, that's why I told them you need to use local people. Same thing. You know, I've been working with Walter. For 20 years here in El Dorado County, and I have to tell you that he is the number one insurance specialist in El Dorado County. I agree. And uh, I, he's fantastic. If you if you need to get if you have an emergency, you contact Walter. You don't have to call an 800 number. This is the guy you're going to contact. And he's going to take care of you. And uh, we're all about customer service. Everybody here yeah. in this room. He came and sat in my living room yeah. when I signed up for insurance with him. And he went over my policy with me. And then he sends me an email every year offering to do it again. To come out and meet with me and go over to me. Definitely That's very good service. That's what sets us apart is, is who are you going to call? You're going to call Walter. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, Walter. I think mm -hmm. on your policies, uh, they all say, you know, they, they didn't meet the, the clearance, but my house was still on the property line. I couldn't do anything with the base lot. They I'm a big lot to go search around. I'm going to clear. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I need Cal Fire out there. Cal Fire showed the property lines. And they had it. Oh, you're good. So submitted their letter that my property lines were clear. And I went in all the same and reissued the policy. Well, you know what happens is the insurance companies, I was going to get to that, but the insurance companies, they want at least 100 people clearance of They don't care if it's on someone else's property line or not because. What the fire department does is they go around during the slow times and they drive around neighborhoods, they look at homes. They say, is this savable or not? And if there's brush within 10 feet of your home and there's, it, it looks dangerous, they're going to say someone's home that does have clearance. Mm -hmm. So insurance companies know that and they want to have good clearance. They want at least 100 feet clearance of brush. Trees are okay, but not brush. Some companies, I'm sort of in a unique situation. I'm a farmer's insurance agent, but I'm also a broker. And farmers let me put uh, insurance policies through other companies. And farmers doesn't take it, which is a big boom. So I go through a lot of different companies. And some companies go up to 200 feet clearance of brush. Mm -hmm. But they take risks that no one else wants. But they go a little bit above and beyond. Another thing they look for is they don't want branches. They want at least five feet of uh, clearance from the branches from the roof. So I have a few things. And what happened to this is that, you know, this is just a checklist how to be safe. Okay, Fire safe. And I won't go into all the details. Yeah, yeah, the there was so right much now. information about yeah. insurance. Yeah, just fit yeah, my house was located by the property line. You know what I do is everybody's paranoid when they come to me. They go, "We don't have a hundred clearance of brush." I'll say, "Well, let's talk to your neighbors. Your neighbors, they want to get the, the brush clear too." And usually they're very receptive. If you're going to go in there and say, "Hey, I want to get a hundred clearance," I'm going to my house was in Sierra Springs, and the actual developer that developed it, it was in a lot. Three or four lots he still has in every cell. His daughter is in the and she's my age too. So she's <laughs> not very chicken either. Uh, yeah, it, for her to come in compliance, because I told her, I said, you know, your tree's going to fall on me this year. I'll clear the property, you know, to a certain point for you, get the tree drop, you know, and I'll make sure to remove it and do a similar thing to do a burn on your property. You know, my time's probably up, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, look, one last thing and I'll get out of here. Mm -hmm. What it, this is, is, I don't know if you want to use it or not, but a lot of uh, new buyers, what they want to do is they want to know what kind of fire protection class they're in, and they want to know how you go about doing it. There's three responding, we have to look at primary responding fire departments, it's not volunteer. Volunteers do not count. It has to be a responding, and it has to be 24-7, they have to be manned. And there's three uh, fire stations that serve Camino and Punk Pines. What it is, is we look at road miles. We don't look at it as a bird class. So what you want to do is map quest. If you get bored and you want to just check out a property, map quest it from the responding fire department to your home. If you put over five miles, you're going to be in fire protection class 10. And there's also a way you can check for fire hydrants. There's a website that uh, EID provides, and you go to EID Fire Hydrant Locator. Just Google that, and it'll show you exactly where the fire hydrants are next to your home. Needs to say, you're going to pay more if it's far away. And I'm through. Thank you very much. You see people in the room, they're great. Thanks, well, Paul. Have a good Thank meeting, you, Walter. Thanks for having Enjoy me. Enjoy Tahoe. I will. Say yeah, hi. Fine. Thanks for having me. Go yeah, check out the floor so tell us if you get a chance. It's very nice meeting you. I guess we need some homework. Now, now you can get <laughs> <now, now, laughs> this. This was definitely worth it because now you're getting no, a homework. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Okay, you guys just after for the uh, meteor shower tonight then? What's it? Oh, I'm, we're going up. She doesn't like bike ride, so we're going to go bike ride. You guys stay overnight though. If yeah, there's a meteor right. shower, watch it. Yeah, yeah. We'll watch it. Yeah, get up on. I live in Pollock Mines. I'm surrounded by trees. Um, we're going to start meteor showers on the building. Yeah, we're going to come from about I'll check it out. 60 to 100 an hour. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah, it'll be like shooting stars everywhere. Yep. Probably at dark. It's really nice, actually. It's a lot. It's really beautiful. Wow. Yeah, I love it. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, thanks for having me. Thanks, Paul. Sorry, I have to run, but I'm on vacation now. All right. <laughs> Enjoy vacation. Thanks, thanks, Paul. Thanks. All right, well, so now it's my turn. So um, I'm actually going to cover the home buying process. If you look inside your folders, the black folders, I have a little flow chart in there that kind of talks about the process. So um, step number one. Of course, you've, you've already taken the first step. You, you come here. You. Um, you've reached out to professionals. Um, you want to get yourself approved for a loan because you can't purchase a home unless you got the money. So I mean, you could want a home. We could be out searching for a home. We could be looking in the wrong price range. But it's very important that you talk with your mortgage lender. In this case, it is Jeff. Jeff Cleaver. He's amazing. You can't be. And uh, <laughs> you can't be. And get yourself approved. Figure out what price range you need to look in, and then and then we meet. And we sit down and we go over what you're looking for in a home. You're, you know, how many bedrooms, size of home, what neighborhood, what school district, all of these things. And then I put in a little search into the uh, MLS and I set up what's called a client portal for you. And I highly recommend that you use your client portal because it's going to be uh, tailored to your needs. Um, I, I also recommend that when you're doing your search, you not go looking on the Zillows and the Trulias and, and all of that. The information is not always up to date. It's, um, it, you know, homes that are pending, the Michelle is pending on these sites. I took a, I put a, a price reduction in on a listing that I have here in Pollock Pines. It took Zillow two days to update that price. That's a $10,000 difference in the price. So when you're searching for your home, you want to uh, make sure you're getting the updated information through the MLS using your client portal. Not only that, you can sort your listings, you can save and reject. I can see the things that interest you. And then we, um, you, I take your saved listings, I set up appointments, I contact listing agents for you, make sure that, uh, that there isn't anything special that we need to know about the home. And then we go out, we hop in the car, it's a fun day, and we go shopping. If we've got a long day, I always pack water and snacks because uh, you know you need sustenance. While you're, I need sustenance while we're out shopping. So um, once we find your home, we sit down, we write a contract. Uh, before we write the contract, we're going to pull the comps because we want to make sure that you make an educated decision on how much you're going to offer on your home, and that's my job is to help you, to to guide you. I'm not I'm not a salesperson. I am I'm a guide for you through the process. Homes sell themselves, and it, you know it's a common misconception that uh, you know sale, real estate agents are like used car sale, salesmen. That's that's not the case. I am here to help you, to to guide you, and make sure you make educated decisions through the process. It's the biggest purchase of your life. Absolutely, it's the biggest, and it's probably one of the most stressful things that you go through. And I never lose sight of that. When I purchase my own homes, I'm a basket case. So uh, it, it's, I never lose sight of how stressful it is. And I've, I've been doing this for 13 years now. So I've got a lot of experience on guiding people through the process and writing the contract. So I'm not going to go into detail on the contract with you. That's something that we do when we actually sit down at the table. It takes about an hour to go through all on its own. It's just the contract. It's a 10-page contract, and it's what the escrow process revolves around. Every scenario that could come up in a real estate transaction in an escrow is addressed in the real estate contract. So, uh, so yeah, we'll, we would do that privately, separately, as we're doing, as we're writing your offer on your home. So we send this over to the seller. The seller either accepts, they may counter offer. You know, we may go back and forth a few times. We get at, we get your offer accepted. Yay! We do a little happy dance. Everybody goes yay, and we open escrow. Woo! Woo -hoo, that's what we call Pete over at Fidelity. We actually uh, Renee Cornelius is our escrow officer in the Placerville office. She is amazing. 
She's, um, I'm working on an escrow, well, actually not with Renee. We have a couple going. You have one in El Dorado Hills going with Debbie Ambrose. Yeah, that's and it. And another, and another one going. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that was with Renee. I think so, yeah, but they've, uh, they're great. They're, they're really great people to work with, and they're on top of it. So I'm not going to go into detail as to what the title company does for you, because that's Pete's department. Uh, but we let, I like to let the professionals that I work with do their jobs. So we start our, um, we, we order up our inspections. The seller has seven days to send the disclosures over to us. We will review the disclosures. We will have the inspections. You, would, you have to plan on when you purchase a home, you have to plan on spending between about six fifty and and $1,000 on home inspections. You're going to get a pest inspection, you're going to get a, uh, a whole house inspection, and you're going to get a septic inspection. What the, is the pest inspection? Now, when you say pest, I, I get confused. Is that, is that it, more than just... Uh, no, no, they're looking for... Inspect uh, your neighbors. Inspect your pest neighbors. No, no, you're not inspecting your neighbors. You're inspecting, when a pest inspector comes out, he's looking for um, active infestation of either bugs or it's wood destroying pests. So like dry rot is a wood destroying pest. It's a fungus that destroys wood. Um, a pest inspector is, so they're looking for active bugs, they're looking for dry rot, but they're also looking for conditions that are conducive to an active infestation. So something like um, wood to earth contract, uh, contact, so if you've got your deck that's attached to your house that's the, the post is straight into the wood, that's that's a lunch call for termites. So um, so so you you want to make sure we don't have wood wood to earth contact. We're also looking for water leaks, things like that that would attract the pest or create dry rot. A whole a whole home inspector actually covers a little bit more in detail. The home inspector does overlap. But he's going to in inspect all the systems in your home, your electrical, your plumbing, your appliances. Uh, he's, he has a look at the roof, although a home inspector is not a roof inspector. But a home inspector can tell you if there are issues on the roof that need to be addressed by a roof inspector. And if, the, if we determine at that point we need a roof inspector, we have them come out. Um, what else? Septic. Septic inspection. Um, that's uh, it's about $200 You because um, it's too... It's two prong. You've got to have somebody come out and locate and uncover the septic lids, and then you've also got to have the in inspection done. And you know, I don't. You don't necessarily need to be at your own septic inspection unless you want to see the hole in the ground or the roots in there, or you know, they, it's dirty work. But <laughs> it does pay to know where the lid is. It does pay to know where the lids house. are, though, because you do have to have that septic pump done in a few done years. One day after you've lived there for three or four years, and then they go, "Hey, where's the lid?" And you're like. <laughs> so, uh, but I do recommend that you attend your other inspections, your pest inspection and inspection, your home inspection. Although these companies will provide you with a report, there's nothing like understanding your report when your inspector has shown you what he has put in that report. You can actually lay eyes on it. Um, every home in every real estate transaction is an as is purchase. So, unless otherwise we agreed upon in writing. So when you're purchasing, when you're having your home inspection, you're not having this home inspection to, uh, this is the list that you're creating for the seller to fix. This is you are determining the condition of the home and determining whether or not you want to continue with, with the escrow depending on the condition of that home. So you can ask for, um, for repairs. That would be your next step is you put in a request for repairs to the seller. The seller can either agree to those repairs, not agree to those repairs. Sometimes you go back and forth a few times. Sometimes they'll meet you somewhere in the middle. Sometimes they'll offer you a credit. Sometimes they'll lower the price of the house a little. There's all sorts of ways that you can negotiate a repair request. Um, once you get through that negotiation, then you remove your contingency, your inspection contingency. So when you write your offer on the house, it's contingent upon you inspecting the oh. home. So you remove that inspection contingency, and then um, it, at the same time, simultaneously, as we're doing all these inspections, Jeff has, uh, has your loan process going. He's been calling you every day, asking for paperwork, all sorts of different things. We have 21 days from acceptance of your offer to get that loan process completed and get you approved for your loan. And um, then we remove your loan contingency. Then we kind of cruise on into close of escrow. Repairs get done on the house if there are any that have been negotiated. 
then um, you get to do your final walkthrough five days before close of escrow. Um, loan documents come to title. We title uh, title company gives us a call. We all we all go sit down. We sign papers. Have another little happy dance. But it's a little happy dance because it's not over yet. Because then all the documents go back to the lender. The lender reviews, sends the funds to title. Title turns around, uh, releases your deed for recording. Once we have confirmation of recording. Then we get to do the big happy dance. I give you your keys. We, we say, yay, happy dance. I want to touch a little bit on the home warranty 